And so here it is on August 26, 2022, and we are opening our class. We are going through Isaiah chapter 42, starting with about verse 14. God, we give you thanks for bringing us together. Help us to open our ears to listen to your words that were written long ago to a country, to a nation, to your people, a people that found themselves in exile, longing to come home and to rebuild their nation. God, help us to hear your words this day that are words that were written for the ages about a new kingdom, about your love, about your Messiah. Amen. 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 Well, there's some really, really uh, wonderful pieces of material here. If we go back briefly uh, to uh, chapter 41, there's a, a passage in, in 41 verse 11 that I, in verse 13, that I really like, that I've been thinking about. If you have your Bibles open, you can leave back to chapter 41, verse 13. And God is speaking. God is speaking to Isaiah. And if we remember, this is an early book. And so Isaiah is not operating with 27 volumes of theology written by uh, people many years later. He's encountering God, right? And if I guess, I don't know whether he's getting to know God or trying to make sense out of what he knows about God. But God says to him in verse 13, for I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not, I will help you. And goes on to say, fear not. You shall rejoice in the Lord. Then in the Holy One of Israel, you shall glory. What an encouraging statement. As you're driving in heavy traffic downtown, because all of those nasty tourists are down from Portland and clogging our highways. Or as you're waiting in the doctor's office to find out what new adventures you're going to be having. Or as you're trying to balance your budget and darned if it just doesn't come out right. There's a place where we have to stop. We have to stop and remember what God said to us. You shall seek those who contend with you. But fear not, for I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand, and it is I who say to you, fear not, I will help you. And then again in verse 14, fear not. What a wonderful introduction to our relationship with God. It's easy for me with my background to think of God as remote as holy, as entirely separate on a great throne. I can envision this throne. And a zillion angels gathered around singing his praises and me falling on my face because this is a really great God and very scary. And God interrupts me, and he interrupts you, and he interrupts Isaiah. Isaiah, he says to Isaiah, relax. It's going to be okay. Relax. I am your God, he says. Relax. I've got you by the right hand. Relax. Except that I am God, right? Except that I created, except that I am 
overarching control over everything. But remember, I've got you by the right hand and I'm walking with you. My image is me standing there with my right hand and God is on my right and he is, and he is sort of leaning against me and comforting me. And what the phrase I've always liked is, it's going to be okay. okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, he goes on to say that life can be hard. He says that in the earlier passage. Without a case. Uh, well, the funeral is uh, tomorrow. What time there is are it? poor and needy who Doesn't need to get um, and there are people who are lost in the desert, and, and there are people who don't understand what is going on, and there are people who don't understand God, but God says, nonetheless, I am there. You can count on me. So that as we begin now in verse 14, he says, for a long time I have held my peace. I have kept myself still and restrained myself. <laughs> God is reassuring us. He says, "It's a, I haven't been intervening. I've kept myself quiet. I've restrained myself. I love thinking about that, of God sitting on this great throne that I imagine, with a zillion angels singing his praise, and he says to himself, not yet. I think he was talking to Isaiah and knowing that the Lord Jesus would be coming and bringing salvation to us all. But this is hundreds of years before Jesus. He is saying, I will restrain myself. I will operate. I will do what needs to be done, but not yet. And we see that in our life, don't we? We see that there are times when there's something we need to happen. And we see there are times when we hope something will happen and God just smiles in a comforting way. Can you imagine God smiling comfortingly? He says, oh, it's going to be okay, Phil. Not yet. Now, God says, now this is God speaking. Now I will cry out like a woman in travail. I will gasp and pant. I will lay waste mountains and hills and dry up all their herbage. I will turn the rivers into islands and dry up the pools. I will lead the blind in a way they know not. In paths that they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I will do. I will not forsake them. They shall be turned back and utterly put to shame who trust in graven images, who say to molten images, you are my gods. The grammar is condensed there. At that last little part, he's talking to the heathen who are worshiping idols, right? He's not talking to the people who he first says, I'm going to open their eyes. So starting uh, early in uh, verse 14, he says, I'm going to intervene. I'm not sitting idly and remote and inattentively on my throne, I'm going to intervene. Right. And we know from the promises that Jesus made that he has the same attitude towards you, towards pastor, right? towards the Dolby's, towards the Stanford's, towards the members of my church. I am here and I'm going to intervene. So, he says, I am going to intervene dramatically so that the people who trust in idols will be put to shame. 
Is that reassuring? I guess it's reassuring in not so much that the people who are trusted in idols are distraught, that isn't reassuring to me, but that God is aware of me and God is attending to me and God is attending to Bonnie and God is attending to you and that we go to worship on Sunday with Pastor Mark and Pastor Wendy and know that God has been attending to them as well and comforting them and taking care of them. So then we get this interesting long passage, uh, verse 18 to verse 24, 25, in which he talks about his way, his way of encouraging us so that we can look with confidence to the weak. <laughs> he says, hear you deaf, and look you blind, that you may see. Then who is blind but my servant and deaf as my messenger when I send a little be ironic here and a little bit sarcastic, right? Will allow him some literary uh, range activities. Uh, who among you in verse 23, who among you will give ear to this will attend and listen for the time to come, to come. Are you going to listen to God? Again, in this very early statement, and as I, Isaiah doesn't know all that's going to come to pass, God says, will you pay attention? Was it not the Lord against whom we have sinned, Isaiah says? in whose ways we would not walk, in whose law they would not obey. So he poured on all these people the heat of his anger and the might of battle that set him in fire round about, but he didn't understand. It burned him, but he did not take it to heart. There were people to whom God tried to communicate who didn't listen or pretended to listen or thought that he was listening. Mark, your phone is ringing. And it is. This is in fact <laughs> reality. <laughs> God is there and you can try to ignore him. God is there and says, I'm taking care of you. There isn't a mountain lion on your back deck whine at the door. And you can be ignore that and not be grateful. But keep in mind that God is present and is attempting to take care of you. Right? In this uh, long passage is an introduction to chapter 43. An introduction which says, I am your savior. I got this. I've got you. I'm ready. I'm willing. I'm able. And I'm intervening. So if we look at chapter 43, beginning with verse 1. But now, thus says the Lord, Isaiah is hearing from God. It is telling us what God is telling him. Right? And God is responding very directly and personally to Isaiah. Isaiah says, help. I don't get what's going on. And God intervenes. And God says, but now... Thus says the Lord. That phrase is one that's used throughout the Old Testament as a way of affirming that what is happening is not just an editorial statement by somebody writing for the weekly newspaper. <laughs> this is God speaking. Thus 
says the Lord, is the way that God identifies that this is his immediate and specific statement to us. But, he says, stop. But, but now, stop. And now listen, thus says the Lord. Who is the Lord? He who created you, O Jacob. He who formed you, O Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you were mine. You can read that last half of verse one as a way to make yourself feel a lot better about today. Okay? He says, don't be afraid. The world is complicated. We probably aren't going to have mountain lions on the back deck, but there are difficulties ahead. All of us face difficulties ahead. As I was thinking about this, I jumped up from my chair to go pick up some materials, forgetting that both of my... So I, God tells Isaiah, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you were mine. And that was what I was saying is such an encouraging thing. God has called me by name. name. Yes. I'm just not a number. It isn't that he has a great batch of social security numbers printed out on computer table that he weighs his hand over. He's called, he's called, he's called Bonnie, right? He's called Tom. We are called by name. And when you, he goes on, let's look at verse two. When things get rough, right? When things really get bad, and they can, and for most of us, they will sooner or later. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame will not consume you. Consume you. You think about these, the folks, the Israelites going through the desert in the heat, but there would be some rivers that would be deep and fast. All of these natural things. And he says in verse three, for I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. How wonderfully reassuring. And we, in fact, I would suggest can adopt this as our own. This is our God. He's the Holy One of Chapel by the Sea. He's the Holy One of Walpole Presbyterian. He is the Holy One, the One God. I gave much for you. And then in verse uh, five, fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar, and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Well, that's a wonderful thought. Those of us who acknowledge our Lord Jesus as Savior, we have been called by name. God reached down and said, Philip John, you're mine. And having had that happen, I know that I am responsible. It says, I, God says, I created you for my glory. It's my job to glorify God. It's my job to read this material with enthusiasm. It's my job to look out at the day and say, how will I glorify God? He goes on to talk about how to glorify God. 
in the next several verses. And they're good ones for us to pay attention to. He says, there are people who are not understanding. These next couple of verses. People who don't understand, even Christians who don't understand what it is that God is calling them to do. And that's easy to understand. Bonnie and I both taught college, and we were talking about some of our experiences this morning. And I can remember so clearly giving the students in the class an assignment and going through it in some detail and looking out at them and seeing that a reasonable number of them weren't paying attention. They don't understand. Even in church, you see people, not in our church, mind you, but you see people working on their cell phones during the sermon and send messages to their Aunt Mildred in Nova Scotia about what the weather is like, or people who were dozing off. I can still remember uh, in one of the churches when I was a kid, the guy falling asleep and falling over onto his wife's lap. And she's, oh, this is during the sermon, and she's grabbing him by the shirt and trying to push him upright. And, uh, and this is not somebody who's paying attention. So bring forth the people who are blind, even though they have eyes, who are deaf, even though they have ears, that all of the nations gather together and let all the peoples assemble. Who among all of these peoples assemble can show us the former things. Let them bring their witnesses to justify them. Okay? Let them hear and say it is true. But God says, right? You, you, Philip, you, Bonnie, you are my witnesses and my servant who I have chosen that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. During these passages at this part of Isaiah, God does a lot of I statements. And it's fun to let your I go, your vision go down through this and see what God is saying about himself. This isn't a God who's remote, on a throne, paying attention to the minutes from the last angels committee meeting, right? This isn't somebody who's out of touch. This is God who is in touch with us. He says, understand, I am your God. Before me, that is before I was created, before I became, no other God was formed, nor shall they be any after me. I, another one of these eyes, pay attention he's to God, I am the Lord. And besides me, there is no savior. I declared and I saved and I proclaimed when there was no strange God among you and you are my witnesses. I am God. And henceforth I am he. And there is none who can deliver you from my hand. I work and who can hinder it? A whole set of encouragements here that I am God, I'm in control, the work that I am doing will be done and no one can mess it up. I spent some time thinking about that. Do churches run into troubles? Yeah. And sometimes there's a squabble within the church or sometimes social forces operate against the church 
there are troubles. But can the troubles of the world and the evil that is done, can that stop the kingdom of God? What's your answer? No. Can the troubles of the world make the gospel of Jesus Christ irrelevant? No. God exists. He sent his son. Jesus died for you. And when you accept him, you are forgiven. Your sins are erased. I am God, he says. And henceforth, I am he, capital H. There is none who can deliver from my hand. I work, and who can hinder it? God says, I am about the business of making my kingdoms happen. I'm going to work at it, and it will happen because I am God. And it's a satisfying uh, intellectual exercise to think of the great people of the church. Think of the uh, Apostle Paul, or think about the great evangelists. All of the things that Billy Graham did, you're a part of, and they won't be interfered with. Because God is still in charge. Billy has gone on to his reward, but his work continues because it's God's work. And so one of the ways as you sit there comfortably is to think about the zillions of people from the time of Isaiah to the time of Jesus, through the history of the world, who have been about the work of God and doing the work of God and accomplishing the work of God, and God is seeing that it happens. Is that encouraging to you? I hope it is. But I'm more than encouraging, I hope it's exciting. Yeah. So I'm sitting here at age 80, and my knees are cruddy, and it's hard for me to walk, and I'm not going to be able to hike out on the beach and pass out tracks very well. I'm not going to be able to do a lot of other things. Right? But in fact, what it is that I can do is what God wants me to do, and we'll see that it works. Now, is is in the middle of the vision of God to Isaiah. It's part of the introduction, do you remember? This is very early. And Isaiah doesn't have a detailed understanding of theology like you'd been to a modern seminary. But God is making it clear to him several things. And let's just for a moment talk about them. First, he is alive and in control. Second, he's got a plan for your life. Third, no one can interfere with it. So whatever it is he wants for you, it's going to happen. Now, we have to be a little cautious there because it may be that what he wants for you is that you get eaten by a cougar while witnessing to be a great example for everyone else. And being eaten by a cougar is probably unpleasant. Okay? This isn't to guarantee that it's all going to be vanilla milkshakes. What it is is that our walk is going to be with God. We're going to be comforted. We're going to be encouraged. We're going to be supported. He's got us by the right hand and is walking with us. So that is one of the first images for today to treasure. God walking with you, next to you, holding your hand. 
walking down the street in front of the house yesterday was a mom with a toddler. And the toddler was all over and kept breaking away from mom and running up in the yards and out into the street and then turned around and ran away from her to the over to Voyage Avenue and was launching himself into Voyage Avenue when she caught up with him. But it was great to see her reach out with her right hand and grab him firmly by the wrist. This was not a casual hold anymore. She had done casual and affirming. This was bomb keeping the kid out of the street, but she held him by the hand. And if you will, it's a good image for us. God is not just walking with us, holding our hands to encourage us, but he's walking with us to help us stay out of the street so we don't get run over by the garbage truck. Okay, take a deep breath. Questions or comments so far? An editorial statement from the pastor? Apparently not. Anybody? Okay. So let's go to verse 14. Remember that Isaiah has some sense of the history of the Jews. And one of the great experiences of the Jews was the Exodus. God helping them leave slavery in Egypt to move to freedom to their new home in Israel. What a wonderful experience and a profound one for the, for the Israelites. And so he's going to build on this now and give us a sense of God continuing his actions. Part of what he wants to do is to reassure us that God continues. He continues with me. He continues with Bonnie. He continues with each one of you. My knees are cruddy. I can't run. I can't climb a mountain. I would probably fall off a stepladder. But God is still there with me. Does that make sense? Part of his being with me is Bonnie standing out there with a large stick not allowing me to get on the stepladder in the first place. That's part of her job. So we look at Isaiah 43, verse 14. Once again, the phrase, thus says the Lord. We had that before, didn't we? The thus means because of what I have just said and what I have just said means leads me to say this as a basic statement of faith to you. Thus says the Lord, the Lord who is your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. And I will be operating in history for you. One of the things we keep in mind is that God operated in history to help create this nation in which we're free to worship. We, God operated in history to create our brothers and sisters with whom we are worshiping. God operated in history to bring Mark and Wendy to us to be our leaders. God has operated in history this morning to allow us to be in communication. Now he says to this in the second half of verse 14, for your sake, okay, he's operating in history for you. 
He's operating in history for Philip. For your sake, I will send to Babylon and break down all the bars, and the shouting of the Chaldeans will be turned into lamentations. For I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator, the Creator of Israel, your King. Oh, he claims for himself several critical things here, doesn't he? And you can claim the same ones. You can recite this verse every morning in your prayer. I am the Lord, your Holy One. Holy, remember, is set aside and set made special. Yeah. Something is holy when you identify it as set aside as a, as a special thing. We tend mostly to refer to God and other divine, thing, divine things, but we can apply that to other things in our, our, our life. I was looking yesterday, we have uh, a cabinet with some of our precious things in it, and there were some blue tiles that my grandfather received from my great-grandfather to bring with him when he reached, when he immigrated to this country. And we have a lovely glass, cut glass vase bowl who was given by dear friends of my parents to Bonnie and I when we got married and still speaks to me of my parents and of their friends. That's a holy thing for me. And God says, I am the Lord, your Holy One, the one who has set himself apart and invites us to set him apart to be our Savior and to be our God. I am the Lord. I am your Holy One, the creator of Israel, your King. And then he goes on to talk about what he has done. He, this says the Lord, once again, thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings forth chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a whip. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, this is the exciting part. All the way back for Isaiah. Behold, I am doing a new thing. I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the, in the desert. The wild beasts will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, where I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I form for myself, that they might declare my praise. And I would suggest, uh, interestingly here, that this is something we should be thinking about. We are the people he formed for himself. Why? That we might declare his praise. Part of what we do when we pray ourselves is to praise God. And he is saying way back then, <laughs> that we might, that our job is to declare his praise. He goes on in verses 12, uh, 22 and 23 and 24 about the various kinds of offerings and sacrifices that the people have brought to the temple or to the worship service 
right? And there are offerings and sacrifices and burned sheep. But the thing that is critical then are the, the next couple of phrases. But you have burdened me, not with sacrifices, do you notice? But you have burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. To me, this so much sounds like a parent. My son, John, was a vigorous, active, enthusiastic kid who in his sports often ended up punching somebody. And he would come stumbling in the house with a bruise or a bloody nose. And what I would feel is a certain weariness. I was concerned for him. I loved him. But oh, for goodness sake, couldn't he keep himself out of trouble? This sounds so much like a parent. God looking down at his people and seeing that once again, individually and a group, as a group, they are sinning. They might be offering sacrifices to him, but they're also offering sacrifices to other gods. They might be offering sacrifices to him, but they might be operating also with violence towards each other. And he says, oh, for goodness sakes, you are burdening me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. Isn't that a lovely phrase? God sitting in his throne and he banging his head against the back of it saying, oh, for goodness sakes, they're doing it again. Oh, oh, I've tried so hard. And I said, my son, and they have the option of being holy. And they're sinning yet again. You have burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. And then he takes the conversation back to himself in the sense of saying, you have burdened me with your sins, but there are several times in the scriptures where the but is a great hallelujah that we can hold on to with joy. I, I am he, he's talking about himself, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my sake, and I will not remember your sins. Put me in remembrance. Let us argue together. Set forth your case that you may be proved right. Your first father sinned, and your mediators transgressed against me. Therefore I profane the princes of the sanctuary, and I deliver Jacob to utter destruction, and Israel to reviling. I did things for you. I provided for your salvation. I provided you with a way of holiness. And you said, God, I understand you are a holy God and want me to be holy. And you went out and sinned. It's like going for a walk and saying, oh, praise God. But then stopping at the casino for five beers and a $5,000 bet on an unreasonable outcome. <laughs> it's combining the prayer of praise with a, yet another transgression. God says, you transgress against me continuously. You show, and because of that, there comes a time when I'm going to interrupt my protection for you. I have been protecting you. But he's telling his, Isaiah, 
in these very early days. Nonetheless, nonetheless, I delivered Jacob to utter destruction. Thinking about utter destruction, we remember the Holocaust and the terrible evil done by the Nazi government to Israel. Was that outside of God's attention to them? Did God not know that that was happening? Well, look at what it says here. God knew. God understood. God understood the cost to the people. God understood that this was a terrible thing. But he says to you, yes, you were ill. Or yes, there's an economic problem. Or yes, there are problems for you to consider. But I am aware and I'm still there. I'm still with you. So that as we look at this, one of the things to keep in mind is over the many, many, many years of the life of Israel and the children of Israel, there were times when they were faithful and times they were not. There were times that were obedient and times that so easily make the transition to not. And so we need to understand God's role with them and with us on the quality in terms of the quality of the relationship we have with him and so my friends we're about out of time so this next week we start on isaiah chapter 44 in which he's going to go back to looking at the nature of God and looking back at the hopes that we can have. Nice. The hope that I can have here that there's still a little coffee in the coffee cup, that would be good. Mm -hmm. But this is a more profound hope. Does God know? Does God care? Is God active? and involved in our lives. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Pastor Mark, a yes. conclusion. I, I will. And I just want to bring out something. Um, last night, we had a Vesper service here at Chapel by the Sea. And the theme of the night was joy. And so I gave out lots of scriptures about joy. And we talked about that. And one of our people made the comment that we oftentimes lose the wow factor no. in our relationship with God, the wow factor. And that's exactly what Isaiah is saying to me in, in these particular scriptures, especially in reading from the message, um, starting with 16. This is what God says, the God who builds a road right through the ocean who carves a path through the pounding waves, the God who summons horses and chariots and armies. They lie down and they can't get up. They're snuffed out like so many candles. Forget about what's happened. Don't keep going over old history. Be alert, be present. I'm about to do something new. <laughs> and that's our life in Jesus Christ, is every day is something new. Um, and God is there. God will always be there for us. No matter what is in front of us, God's presence is there. Don't lose the wow factor. <laughs> so, Phil, thank you very much for bringing these scriptures out. And next week, we will start with Isaiah 44. Read ahead. Read whatever translation you have. And I will close us in prayer. God, we thank you. For you are our wow factor, but sometimes we lose it. Like living so close to the ocean, we forget its majesty and its beauty. 
help us to see it in it all with its wonders, not just the ocean, but your ocean of joy. And so God, we give you thanks. Continue to open our ears that we would hear and our eyes that we may see you in all that we do. Amen. Amen. God bless you all and have a great week and I'll see you next week.